Sensei Emmett, uh, so glad to have you on our show. I don't know much about you, but I know you have a YouTube channel. Can you tell me a little bit about your YouTube channel? Yeah, well, my name's Sensei Emmett Doyle, and I'm an instructor in a system called Shinken Goshen Jitsu, which is a kind of a karate judo blend that okay. was sort of formed in the 60s. And uh, I've been doing that now for about 15 years, I'm doing martial arts about 26 years in total, including okay. boxing, kickboxing, all the rest. And then during the current lockdown and COVID, I decided I wanted to do something on YouTube at so much time. And I started with doing techniques and trying to teach. But then I thought that there's so many people doing that. Mm -hmm. And I thought it would be interesting to research martial arts that aren't known very well and yeah. try and bring them to the forefront. So uh, I started to do that. And I found a vast amount of martial arts from all over the world and uh, historical martial arts. And I've kind of searched out the masters of them and kind of interviewed them and brought the, both the masters and the martial art to the YouTube forums. So it's been quite an interesting journey. Yeah, that's really cool. I, you know, I've been um, kind of just getting to know, like we did the kind of the same thing. You know, I have a school here in, in Texas. Uh, I live in a place called Kyle, Texas, which is just outside Austin, Texas, if you know where that is. And um, when we had to close down back in March, uh, started to look into like, you know, how do I promote my school digitally? And we started kind of a little YouTube channel. We haven't really put as much effort into it, uh, unfortunately, but you know, we're still, you know, plugging away. And it's a, it's a unique challenge trying to do something on YouTube, especially now because, you know, everything's been so established over the last, you know, 10 years or so, but uh, yeah. Yeah, it's fun. Um, there's so many in the last year that have, because of COVID, yeah. that have all jumped on and all of a sudden there's a thousand new YouTube channels around karate and it's yeah it's, it's very competitive recently. So, but it's a lot of fun, a lot of information out there now. So. Absolutely. So where did you say you're from? I'm from Ireland, from the very north of Ireland. So That's amazing. The, the I, I, cold I, country. Celtic culture, it's like my favorite culture of all. I don't know as much as I'd like, but uh, I think it's cooler from Ireland. I always like to go visit there. I went to uh, England for a little while. Um, I did a Europe trip when I graduated high school and started in England, but, and we went up to Scotland. I couldn't understand anything people were saying <laughs> uh, when I got there, but it was, a, it was a good experience for sure. Yeah, definitely. So Scotland. Think, continue. Scotland's beautiful now, and it's it's Ireland's very similar to Scotland yeah. culturally. It's um, I suppose it's a Celtic kind of past, and it's just kind of sweeped across Scotland and down through Ireland. So it's a very linked history between the two countries. Yeah. So you you started in karate, you said? I started in boxing originally when I was eight. Okay. And then when I got to about well, I actually started to jiu-jitsu about eleven. Uh, to Japanese to jitsu when I was at school and I never really took it too serious kind of thing it was just something to do at school yeah it's kind of got me out of class occasionally but uh and then about 14 I started kickboxing mm -hmm. I kind of through my teens I kind of competed boxing and kickboxing and kind of kept it to jiu-jitsu but still never took it serious until I had about 20 mm -hmm. and then sort of dropped the boxing kickboxing kind of moved into the more grappling arts and I've been doing that ever since, and I think about about 22 years I discovered the system I'm actually doing now, Shin Ken Goshen Jiu Jitsu, and it's, it was very similar to the Japanese Jiu Jitsu. Mm -hmm. So, and um, the thing I liked about them originally was they're very sort of into evolving. It's always trying to improve, and they pressure test everything, and if it doesn't work, they improve it, mm -hmm. and they promote cross training to everyone it's it's if you can find a better way to do it go learn it come back mm. and help everybody improve and i like that kind of mindset that always always improve yeah for sure it's really cool and so you have a school you we do yeah it's the organization i'm working for at the man is called the dragon all style martial arts federation and here in ireland where i am now is 
think there's seven schools in the area. Okay. And it's, there's four instructors that kind of work between the seven schools. So cool. it's it's a lot of fun. Like you could be in a different be- school each night kind of thing. So it's it's a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. You guys must be super busy. Four instructors, seven schools. Yeah, we would be now. It's it's very busy, but uh, I think our busiest time would we would usually hold the tournaments later in the year. Unfortunately, there last November we didn't, but we'd hold a tournament between each of the schools. Yeah. So they, they would all meet up in the on the biggest school and they kind of compete. We'd have uh, kumite competitions and kata weapons. So it's a lot of fun, but there's a lot of hard work and organizing behind it, and yeah. a lot of work by the students to get ready for it. So. For sure, that's really cool. Um, so, what are some of these uh, your favorite disciplines that you've discovered over your exploration of your YouTube channel? Uh, one of my favorites would probably be um, an English historical martial art called Bartetsu. And yeah. uh, to me- begin with, when I heard the name, I thought it was a joke martial art to start with. Yeah, it's really old though, right? It's like a hundred years yeah, old. It's- it's it's very it's Victorian, Victorian times. So you're going back to the late 1800s, it was yeah, it was sort of formed and it was a very sort of gentlemanly art. So it was kind of the the upper class classes would have done it. Yeah, and uh, it's unusual because usually you would see martial arts in a gi or mm-hmm. in brass gardens, but uh, a lot of bar tattoo would be practiced in a three piece suit. Yeah, yeah. So it was, it was a lot of it was a lot of fun kind of looking under that and it's it's very heavily based on the Japanese arts as well as a big jiu-jitsu kind of influence mm-hmm. on it and a big boxing influence so it's probably because of the arts that I practiced most in the past is a major part of it so that kind of really drew me into it mm-hmm. but uh, that's very very interesting yeah and, uh, what else uh, there's a few there's actually a Hawaiian martial arts as well, uh, Luya. Huh. It sounds quite interesting. Now. It's uh, I'm actually got an interview in a few weeks with one of their masters, but it's uh, a lot of wrestling kind of stuff. But their weapons are interesting. It's like a oar from a boat would be one of the weapons. Yeah. So it's it's unusual, but I'm Is looking forward they, to find out more. That they like put like shark teeth on or something, and it, they... yeah, yeah, all that kind of thing. It's very seems to be very influenced by the ocean and travel and navigating and yeah. all that kind of thing. So I suppose with Hawaii, having that cultural history, that's yeah. probably influenced it a lot. So That's really cool. Yeah, it seems like these days there's a lot of interest in like Indian martial arts and uh, Polynesian martial arts and things that, you know, areas that we really haven't explored as a like a world culture that much. Um, yeah, I, I find it very fascinating as well, for sure. Um, so, how has COVID been affecting your business? Well, our business has been closed since March last year. Oh so man, like completely not closed like, at all. You can't train at all. Can't train at all at the moment. But uh, oh well, I'm lucky enough now. With my my oldest daughter, she's 15 now, but she be she be quite good at. Uh, martial arts as well so most evenings we would get a little bit of a sparring match or do we better training at home but it's not the same as it's been in the dojo so but yeah. at least we're lucky enough to have something we can kind of keep up training with but i know a lot of people haven't got anything at all in the past year so i mean i couldn't survive being closed for a year how, how are schools closing down all over ireland right now yeah everything's closed here now it's uh I think gyms are closed, restaurants, cafes, bars, everything's closed. I mean, are they like going out of business? I mean, I'd be going out of business. A, a lot of them are now, a lot of them are. But uh, I think we've been lucky enough now, our rent has been froze and all that for the year, so we have no costs to upkeep. Oh, but, uh, nice. So we were very lucky that way, but it's, I'd say it's gonna be very hard to get the students back once we do reopen. After been so long out of it, now, but you know, I um, most people, at least in America, in the industry, uh, back in March we had to close down, and then you know, depending on the state, you know, 
places started to open back up and what most people started to do was offer virtual lessons and they just basically yeah. continued with contracts uh through through the lockdown doing virtual lessons and uh we decided that you know people were paying for in-person lessons not virtual lessons so we were going to freeze all of our contracts and just offer a special virtual membership and yeah. you know we only got a smaller group to come over because most people you know just wanted to do in-person lessons um but what i, I kind of shot myself in the foot because what i realized is that once people break their training routine it's so hard to get them back into it and they're yeah looking for something new to excite them and so i mean that's a really big thing that i think people don't understand like once you break a fitness routine like if they haven't done any fitness for a year it's going to be so hard to get them back in there and, and you know are they going to want to go back and do something they've been doing for four or five years that they've explored a lot or do they want to do something new that's going to get them excited and you know when they go back they might want to do something else and so yeah I think it's going to be really tough rebuilding those schools. I mean, not trying to, you know, cast shade or make you worried or anything. I mean, it's really yeah. great, but I, that's a really big thing that people aren't talking about that people don't really understand. Uh, fitness, yeah. you maintain, you know, um, to keep them. Definitely not. Yeah. It's been really hard for us here in the States. A lot of my friends have lost their schools and I think the whole industry is, is, in a lot of ways been suffering some of the bigger schools have done well just because a lot of the smaller stuff like kickball and baseball and whatever you probably yeah. have sports that are usually done but um those sports aren't really meeting right now and so the only thing they can do is like martial arts uh because martial arts are one of the few professional you know sports you know physical activity yeah. to do um and so those schools are staying open because you know professional martial arts instructors have some stake in the game to keep their schools open um unlike you know you know t-ball which is like you know some dad who's just kind of coaching it and they're not really making money off it um yeah but yeah um so what were some of you know kind of to switch gears a little bit what were some of the hardest moments in your career as a martial artist, what's the most difficult times, most trying experiences for you? Um, the one that sticks out really was uh, I actually was going up to test for my brown belt a few years back, and uh, what this is was, what's, sorry, what style was this you were testing? In? This was in the style I'm teaching now, the Shinken Gosh and Jitsu, but uh, it was about two years, but. About five years, six years ago, I was going for my brown belt, and about two weeks before, I actually teached in a class, teaching a kids' class, and had went over my ankle and broke the foot. Oh man! And it was two weeks to go now, and it was two years of training up to, up to this testing, and it was two day, two days of testing for it, and so I'd say it was maybe about about eighteen days prior to it, and I had a broken foot going on, and uh, the Grading officers were saying like you, you can't you can't test today, and uh, I finally convinced them anyway and got on, got through it, passed it. Luckily, I don't know how, but it was I I got it. through it. And uh, Super but, uh, I think that kind of gave me a lot of uh, strength after, because I thought if I can do that, there's very little that can't be achieved now. So, but uh, I've used it recently too for students to kind of demonstrate that things happen and you just move past them, get it on and it'll make you stronger after. But it's, it was definitely a challenge at the time. But yeah, it was... that's really cool. Um, yeah. it, it reminds me of a experience I had. I had a student who dislocated both his kneecaps the night before his testing. And that was a, a story on its own because I remember he was kicking. I don't know if it was like doing a flying sidekick or something, but he just went down. He just crumpled to the ground, and he just said, "I've never seen this before." He started to say, "Help! Help! Help! Help!" Like he's like stuck on loop, you know. And everyone's freaking out, you know. It's help! 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 Yeah. And they make a circle around him, and they go over there, and I don't know what's going on. He goes, "What's going on?" And he's just like holding his leg and, and yelling, "Help!" Okay. And this is a grown adult. This is when I had my college program, and so they're all college students. And I go over there, I say, and I'm trying to be all calm because I'm the head instructor, you know, so I got to like make everyone calm. I'm like, it's going to be all right. You know, let me take a look here. And they pull the pant leg and I can't figure out what I'm looking at. Like, 
like I'm supposed to put this back in, but I don't know which way to turn it because it's all so screwed up and weird looking. Yeah. <laughs> it looked like a leg. And oh. right as I was going to do something, like just picking his leg up, like slid it back into the socket. But anyway, um, this guy dislocates both his knees and then he went and tested like that weekend at my testing. Oh. And I was so proud of him, you know, such a, such a BA, but uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it takes a lot. It takes a lot now, but yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. My daughter, my daughter still gets a laugh from the foot story with me because I was in crutches at the time. I went up the stairs in crutches, put them down, graded for two days, and left at the crutches and went back out to the car. And she's, the only thing was, you now I was for about three days before it, I was able to kind of put weight on the foot, so it was healing, but. I've Impressive. probably done more. I've probably done more damage by testing than I than I would have done if I rested it. But it's I right. think it was just stubbornness. I think it was. But... That's good. I respect that. Um, so, what are your some of your most exciting moments? You know, in your career and your life training martial arts. Uh, it's probably seeing a student reach black belt. It would be when you see them coming up through the ranks and work a lot with them it's it's putting them in through the test and then leaving them to it that's and seeing them coming out successful and you know they've put the work in and it's it's great to see them actually working setting that goal and then smashing it and yeah it's you can see their hard work paying off after so many years and it's, yeah it's sure. always it's always the highlight now but do you teach a lot of kids at your school, or mostly? We do I think between the seven schools now we have about two hundred and fifty kids. Okay, so wow. it's 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 a lot now, but it's uh we take them on from five up to. I think the first the first kids classes would be five to maybe ten year olds, and then there'd be eleven to sixteen year olds. So mm -hmm. most most schools would have two age groups going on all the time like so it's yeah that's um a really powerful thing I, you know when i was uh younger i like when i was in high school i was thinking about you know what i was going to do with my life and I, I was going to go off to college just to you know at very least you know get an education and um i wanted to potentially be an english teacher uh because I liked English, and so I started t studying uh, English education. And I realized, you know, I eventually graduated, and I kind of changed into um, just English because uh, I realized that the most powerful thing I could teach was martial arts. You know, with something like English, you know, I might first of all I can only talk about English with my students, which seems like a very limited scope. You know, compared to martial arts, where you can talk about everything. You know, you can talk about you know leadership, life skills, and you know, good diets and, you know, wellness and exercise, you know, everything. And it's like so many disciplines wrapped up in the one, which is so great. And then also like, you know, if I was an English teacher, maybe I'd have a student for one or two semesters at most, but with like martial arts, you can watch that same student, you know, who signs up with you when they're five years old, come back to you yeah. when they're 25 years old after they graduate college to continue with their training. That's like such a, a beautiful thing. And I, like, the reason why I asked if you had, you know, kids in your program is because I've seen just like remarkable things with those kids because you're starting so young. And like I've had some kids who were just kind of running around like chickens with their heads cut off, very like, you know, misbehaved when they first come in on the first day, who are like my absolute best students, you know, two or three years down the road, you know, in my leadership team and um, really leading the class. And it's just, I don't think, you know, I, I haven't done that many other sports. I did a little wrestling and a little soccer when I was younger, but I, my, my experience, like no other sport can really do that, you know. Yeah. Not saying that martial arts is necessarily just a sport, but um, yeah, it has a really powerful effect on people. And, and I think teaching is just really rewarding. I assume you would agree. Yeah. So, so I have a great student at one of my clubs now, and I remember her first day coming on. Yeah. And she was so quiet and her and her brother joined the same day and she didn't want to come on the mats and I think for the first two, three weeks she didn't. Mm -hmm. Then she slowly started to come on and a year later 
she basically smashed everyone at the tournament and came out she won it and she was only six or seven and then she asked could she fight the winner of the the older category and we were like no it's so the confidence the confidence boost was unbelievable she within a year she couldn't step on the mats to want to fight a 16 year old yeah. full on sparring it was yeah yeah i see a lot of that too you know confidence building and stuff it's really important it's part of what we do um so like what do you think were some of your biggest influences in your martial arts development you know, like, did you have any role models that you really looked up to? Any books that you read? You know, things like that. I don't know. I think when I was at school, now when I was about eleven or twelve, I was actually I was boxing and kickboxing and stuff, and uh, I was getting into a lot of fights. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of, to be honest, a bit of a jerk at school. But I was one of the teachers. There, I was a biology teacher, and uh, he kind of introduced me to jujitsu at the time, mm -hmm. and. As I said, I never really took it serious, but it was when I left school about 18 and kind of kept training with him for a while. And I, th I think he was a big influence from then on. And uh, I think he sort of showed me that there's more to martial arts than the fighting. I was just always wanted to fight. He kind of showed the, the morals behind it and sort of the more mindful and spiritual side of things. And I think that kind of kind of cares me a bit as a as an adult it was yeah kind of a lot more relaxed now and to be honest that sort of the test fighting at this point but mm -hmm. it's, it sounds a bit contradictory but no i it's... think yeah i think that's kind of the goal like um you know when i was younger i was very competitive and i i wanted to be a top you know competitor and stuff and i did a lot of that but I think at the end of the day, what I took away, which I think is what most martial arts take away, is that the the life skills are the most important thing. I mean, you may need to defend yourself one or once or twice in your life if you're unlucky, but you're going to use those leadership life skills every single day of your life. Like that's the most important yeah. way, and um, you know, also the camaraderie that you get from it. You know, especially with your dojo, which is like your clan. I think I feel like it's really important, especially right now. That's what a lot of people need is that community yeah. you know a lot of people are feeling lost um you know so is there any um are you a a reading man do you like are there any books that you've read that you, that you would recommend to my students that... i think the one that would stand out most is probably bruce lee's book of high of d condo it's it's very technical kind of reading but there's a lot of great messages on there it's yeah, it's very um, intense, right? I mean, I feel like uh, that book should be read like maybe a little bit later on down the path because I remember I was a pretty advanced martial artist when I picked it up and I was like, whoa, Bruce Lee, you're going like super deep. I'm having trouble following you. Like I remember picking up when I was like 18 and I started training when I was five, you know, and I had a lot of experience. Yeah. I still was like, it's good, but it's it's very technical, you know? Yes, that and I think the, the Book of Five Rings is definitely another bit of essential reading now of Miyamoto Musashi, but yeah, as, as you said again, it's kind of further down the line, more advanced. Have you read a book called Zen and the Martial Arts by Joe Himes? I haven't. I have I actually got it, you but should. I haven't actually got around to reading it yet. I got it for Christmas there, but... That's what I usually recommend when students are getting started, that or like Be Like Water, like these books are a little bit more approachable, I feel like. Like, uh, the Book of Five Rings is also very good, but like, dude, that guy, Miyamoto Musashi, I know he's like the greatest, like, duelist of all time, but he probably was not like the best guy to like be your friend. Uh, it's all about solitary lifestyle and just like, you know, um, you know, taking no prisoners and stuff. So, yeah, good book. It's definitely the like, classic you have to read, you know, but it's, it's, yeah. uh, it's dense. Yeah. It's not dense, it's not like, it's dense, but it's not a big book, but yeah. um, what about media? Is there any, you know, movies and stuff that you've, you've watched that, you, that really inspired you? I mean, I was really inspired by Karate Kid, and have you been watching the new Cobra Kai? Yeah, oh, Cobra Kai is brilliant now. It was, uh, I forced my wife to watch the whole season three in one sit down, but the, she, she has no interest in martial arts or Cobra Kai, but she sat through it, but 
an excellent season. But yeah, I feel like you know, there's been a lot of like kind of mixed martial arts movies that have come out, but they never really um, like inspire me the same way that Karate Kid did yeah. and these Cobra Kai's. And I think it's because these are really human stories and talking about, you know, people and like their ambitions and their struggles. And it's not really about the martial arts. It's like the martial arts is kind of a backdrop, but it's really yeah. about characters and their lives and stuff, which is so passionate and like why you fall in love with the martial arts. Um, yeah. So, yeah. And I think that I haven't seen season three, so don't, don't, don't tell me anything, but I'm really excited yeah. to watch it with my school. We have a, like a watch party coming up. We're going to watch together, but, um, I watched season one and two, and they're really good. Yeah. Are there any movies like that? Like... that, that What's up? Are there any movies like that or, or shows that come to mind? Um, I've always been a big Jet Li fan. Now. I've, I've liked um, Heroes and Fear. Mm. All those kind of... I uh, think I'm obsessed with the samurai kind of thing, so it's... Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, so... Do you guys, yeah. Yeah, do you have a, like your own kind of um, media and stuff over there in Ireland, or do you guys watch just a lot of American films? It's a lot of American films. Now, there is media here, but it's very small, and I'd say you'd be maybe lucky to get 100 films a year kind of thing. It's, yeah, sure. But, uh, it's, and even if you did get 100, maybe only two of them would be good. It's What's like the best Irish film that you would recommend for me to watch? Um, there's there's actually a comedy called Wake and Ned. It's Rick, very very funny now. Wake and Ned. But uh, Wake and Ned, yeah, it's um, it's actually about a guy that wins the lotto, uh -huh. wins the lottery, and uh, passes away while he's watching it, huh. and his his friends find him, and instead of announcing that he's dead, one of them pretends to be him, and claims the fortune, and they have the whole town in on it. But uh, it's very funny film now, but. Have to watch. Excellent movie. Yeah. That's cool. I, I, you know, I lived in Korea for a long time and Koreans are a little bit like that. They, they watch a lot of American films, but sometimes yeah. it's interesting like what, get, what, what comes over to Korea. Cause it's not always like the, the most popular film. Like I was surprised when my wife didn't know what Lord of the Rings was. And I was like, you don't know like Lord of the Rings. Like this is like a big thing, but then there would be like, Mission Impossible Five would come out, and she would have seen that one. And I'm like, or I don't know what number we're up to, but it would be like kind of like a B-level, you know, movie. And yeah. she that one, but she hadn't seen some of the bigger ones that just maybe didn't mesh with Korean culture as well. Um, yeah. But I've watched a lot of Korean dramas, uh, which are all, are really really different, but also really fun. They're, they're yeah. Heart wrenching. I think a lot of the Irish media is very based around comedy now. Is a uh... I think there's something about Irish. It's everything's humorous. It's. Is I, I don't even think Irish people. I, I think Ireland as a country, they just can't. They can't be serious ever. It's. It's everything's comical. It's so it's very interesting. <laughs> That's what we need right now. Is um, Irish humor kind of like British humor, or how is it different? How is um, I think it would be a bit darker now. It's. It's definitely darker. The Scottish and Irish humor would be very dark. It's, it's cool. But, uh, yeah. Some of it now would make you cringe. It would be kind of a oh, wee bit over the line, but... <laughs> it's cool. I think the Irish have a habit of seeing how far they can push an audience Yeah. before, uh, before people start to get insulted. So. Yeah. So, um, to kind of take our topic a little bit further, you know, what are um, some things that have, what are some uh, inspirational things that you can think of uh, for like our, you know, we have you know, new students at the school who are just getting into martial arts for the first time. What inspired you when you first got into the martial arts uh, to get like really, you know, jazzed about it? Because you must've been pretty jazzed to be doing it for, I don't know, is it like 20 some years or, or whatnot? Yeah. yeah? So yeah, I think I think when I first started now, when I started with boxing, I think it was just my dad. It was just you're going to learn to box. It was just the big thing to do at the time. Yeah. But I think um, 
when I started to get more interested in the martial arts such as jiu-jitsu and that, I think it was more to do with media and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, the yeah. Karate Kid. When I started to come across movies like that, I kind of I wanted to learn the crane kick and learn how to use a set of nunchucks. And yeah. I think that kept me inspired through my teens anyway, but and I think the time I sort of had 18, 19, I was so in depth on it. It was, I just kind of, I just wanted to do it all the time. And mm. I kind of, it was one of those, I don't want to get a full time job. I want to teach martial arts all day, every day. And, but, uh, yeah, a few years later, I'm still doing it. <laughs> <laughs> I think teaching martial arts is a full time job. It's a lot of work, you know. Yeah. To run a good school, you know, you gotta do paperwork and phone calls and stuff during the day and teach yeah, it. Yeah, it's such a. You know, so it's, it's a. Yeah, six days a week, you know. You, don't, you know, sometimes I gotta we work actually, for festivals and whatnot, so. Yeah, we actually started a business just before COVID. Me and uh, our head instructor, we got formed a business doing uh, self defense classes, going under sort of situational awareness and. Sort of psychology of fear and things like that, and a few basic techniques. And we were aiming it at um, young school kids. So we were going into the school and teaching maybe a six week course in the schools. And uh, we just we had a load of schools sign up. Mm -hmm. And then COVID happened and the whole thing just stopped. So mm -hmm. it was kind of it was kind of stopped before it started, kind of thing. But well, hopefully you get back to it. That's kind of sad, but I'm sure you'll you'll be able to rekindle it when this is all over. Hopefully, not. yeah. But, uh, well, anyway, we just thought we, thought we weren't teaching enough for the clubs, so we thought we'd take the, the clubs to the schools. And... Yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. I mean, I think those outreach programs are really important for you know funneling students to your main school. I mean. It's a very competitive environment these days. I remember when I was younger and I started in, you know, Taekwondo, that's my principal discipline. And yeah. um, back in the day, like I, I trained in like a moldy ba a basement with like moldy carpets and, you know, the fiberglass was kind of hanging down and smelled like bleach yeah. and sweat and you go into the bathrooms and there's no like toilet paper or like soap. And yet it was packed with people because there, there wasn't that much competition and people didn't really you know, it's kind of like barbecue joints here in Texas. Like they, they all look like they're yeah. in it, that kind of culture was like acceptable. But now the standard of, of martial arts business has gone up so much that if you want to be able to have like a, a real professional school. You have to do so much stuff. It's, it's yeah. Um, and like I mean, those outreach programs is kind of necessary. Yeah. I think there was a lot of benefits to that kind of old, old school kind of gym as well. Like it's kind of, yeah, for sure. I think a lot of really hard men came out of it. It was you, you had to be tough to train on it. it was, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I remember my boxing gym was the same now. It was the the, the floor was literally lifting up and there was what flooding yeah. in the corners and it was oh, it was bad but Yeah. It, was, it, yeah. it always reminds me of the old Rocky films kind of thing where it was real real grit and two and nails kind of yeah 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 and like training with adults and kind of being like sort of ignored on the side and just, yeah you know i think kids these days don't really appreciate uh that experience you know you try to make things yeah. a little bit harder on them sometimes and you know the parents start getting involved and saying you know look this is you know these are just kids they can't handle it and i'm like well i was a kid and i could handle it you know what what makes yeah. them any different they, they can handle it it's just that our our society has can't handle it really we've all become a little soft um so yeah but you know sensei emmett it was really great to meet you i'm glad we got to sit down and have this conversation you know maybe i'll have to have you back on sometime to talk about a specific topic in particular it sounds like you know a lot about the martial arts and got a lot of cool experiences um anything you know that let my viewers know before i uh before we sign off no i think i covered everything there it was a pleasure to be here and uh, it was great meeting you and, yeah uh, nice. big, big fan of the youtube channel so it was really honored to be asked to come on and absolutely it was, it was, it was a pleasure 
you're ever in Texas, why don't you stop by my school? You know, work out with us a little bit. And, you know, if I'm ever in Ireland, I'll look you up. Yeah, definitely do, mate. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. And uh, thank you. Yeah. All right, man. Well, take care. All the best. All right.